So uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Stuart Hanroff to the University of Tokyo. Uh, he's somebody uh, who really needs no introduction. Uh, suffice it to say, it's such a quantum pleasure to have you here. And also, I should say that uh, great minds recognize other great minds. And Roger Penrose, who receives the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2020, has collaborated with Professor Hamelow for how many years now? 20? Since 1995, 94. So 26, so, yeah. Almost, yeah. You might make it to 30. So the great mind of Roger Penrose, Sir Roger Penrose, has recognized the greatness of uh, Professor Stuart Hamelow. And in the next 60 minutes, you will know the reason why. <laughs> and afterwards, uh, you'll be taking questions. Yeah. So. They can interrupt too. Yeah, or, or, or anyway, so please, Stuart. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for being here. And uh, it's a great pleasure to see my old friend Ken Mogi. Yeah. Who's been Just check me. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that better? Yes. OK, now you can. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see Ken Mogi again. He's been to our conference, The Science of Consciousness in Tucson a number of times and given uh, great talks there. And I want to thank Hide Sagusa for uh, arranging this and uh, helping with my trip here. And, um, and thank you all for coming. So I'm going to talk about consciousness, the science of consciousness, with a special emphasis on the theory that Roger Penrose and I developed called orchestrated objective reduction. And a number of you have already told me that you're uh, familiar with it and very, uh, very eager to hear about it. So, um, what we see here is, uh, outside of my, my name and affiliation, uh, is, oops. So, we take it for granted. Let's see if I can use my cursor. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. You can see the cursor? Yeah. Um, we take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world out there appears inside of our head. And if it has subjective experience, I use Bing to mean phenomenal experience, the hard problem, actually having consciousness as opposed to being a robot or being an uh, uh, autopilot. And we do many things without consciousness. But with consciousness, if you see Bing, that means that that's what we're trying to explain. Bing is not intended to explain it, it's to, it's to point to what we want to explain. And if we go from the top, upper left, we see different ways that people approach the problem. So neuroscientists um, probe the brain with electrodes and other ways of examining brain activity. And then artificial intelligence, roboticists, um, try to build uh, consciousness into computers and into robots. And then artists try to get the essential features of reality, of, of uh, uh, aesthetic qualia uh, into art as much as possible. And then we see uh, Schrodinger's cat, the physicist, dealing with the nature of reality. And uh, how do we know what we see is, is real? And uh, then we see the psychiatrist who goes inward into the subconscious. And then we see an anesthesiologist who looks suspiciously like me. <laughs> and uh, I am an anesthesiologist. I, I work in the operating room putting people to sleep and waking them up. And uh, it's really a great way to study anesthesia, to study consciousness. And meditators who go inward and on their own. And then uh, philosophers, Western philosophers in this case, uh, who uh, have been pondering this for many, many years. So one such Western philosopher is Plato, and this could be Plato, and he realized that uh, uh, the world out there is all in our head. It's a representation. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all in our head and there's nothing out there. Some people think that, that consciousness is all there is. But our perception of reality is all in our head. And I think we can 
Well, most of us would agree with that. Oops. So being is the representation. The representation has consciousness in Western philosophy. I have to do this slowly or it jumps. And it's not advancing. Goes too many. Okay. So what you saw in Plato's head is actually fairly. Uh, what, what, inside our brains, we know that conscious perception, the picture that we see of the rea of reality, happens in three ways, and it takes several hundred milliseconds, which is actually a pretty long time. So all of our senses, except for smell, all the other senses go through the thalamus, the, uh, the part of the brain that's right in the middle there, you see the thalamus. So whether it's from the eyes, the ears, the touch, the spinal cord, taste, everything except smell goes through the thalamus. Smell goes directly into olfactory cortex. And big, uh, consciousness happens. But it takes about 300, 300 to 500 milliseconds after sensory impingement for the activity that occurs in our brain that we know correlates with consciousness. And yet, we often respond to visual inputs uh, in less than 100 milliseconds, seemingly consciously. And here's Nadal, the great tennis player, hitting a, a serve, could be a serve, and uh, we know if we measure the activity in his brain, uh, it hasn't happened yet, and yet he's responding. And he, he would tell you that he's responding consciously. Maybe not seeing the racket hit the ball, but seeing the ball when it's almost there. But yet that activity hasn't happened in our brain. And this is a problem for neuroscience. Because it forces neuroscience and philosophy to say that Consciousness is epiphenomenal. Since the activity hasn't happened yet, they say, well, it's non-conscious processing that's swinging the racket and hitting the ball. And later, we have this conscious sensation that we were in conscious control. And it's an illusion. Now, I'm not saying that. That's what conventional mainstream neuroscientists would say, that it happens after the fact. And we have a false illusion that we're in control. And therefore, consciousness is an illusion. And there are many people think that. Now, the hitting, hitting the tennis ball or doing any action is part of uh, what's called the perception action cycle. So um, you see inputs over here coming in, and uh, they go all the way up to the brain, and then result in an action. Now, this can be at the level of the spinal cord. You know, if you hit your knee with a hammer, or your leg jerks. That's a spinal cord uh, reflex, and that just goes across the spinal cord. It doesn't go to the brain. And we have various uh, a activities that happen on the way up. And uh, uh, the, the spinal cord is algorithmic, and it's algorithmic all the way up except for consciousness, or maybe most of the way up except for consciousness, which has non-algorithmic properties. At least that's what Roger Penrose said. Otherwise, we would, we would be... Uh, like, uh, we wouldn't have any creativity or intuition or free will. We would all be just uh, following an algorithm. And it could be like that, but, but I don't think so. So as you, as you go up, it gets less algorithmic and more conscious. And the very top, we see a conscious perception and then a non-computable or non-algorithmic trigger of action that uh, can go to the spinal cord and result in an output. So um, there's various levels of perception and action, uh, and they don't all have to be conscious. Keeps jumping ahead. Now, as I said, it involved, the consciousness involves three waves. And one reason we know this is that only the third wave, OK, so I didn't tell you what the three waves are. So uh, from the thalamus, the first wave goes to primary cortex. In the case of vision, that's uh, area V1 in the back of the brain. And from the back of the brain, there's a feed forward, number two, 
that goes to the front of the brain, to the prefrontal cortex and similar areas. And then the third wave radiates out, and that's what correlates with consciousness. And that's what takes uh, several hundred milliseconds. <laughs> and work from George Mishore at the University of Michigan has shown that only the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia. So um, that tells us that the third wave is responsible for consciousness, even though it happens too late. So that's a problem we're going to come back to. But the third wave does correlate with consciousness. Now the third wave uh, idea is consistent with all the other major theories of consciousness, actually all of them, including ours. Uh, integrated information theory of uh, Tidoni and, and Koch, uh, uh, global neuronal workspace, uh, uh, Stan Dehane and uh, Jean-Pierre Changeau and others, uh, PC, uh, predictive coding and uh, uh, recurrent processing, hot higher order thought, and Orca R, which is our theory, although Orca R happens at a deeper level. All the other ones are really kind of wiring diagrams, just showing at this level uh, where, the, where information is flowing, without telling us really what the information is and at what level. But um, this general scheme is consistent with all of them. Also, uh, Libet's 1979 neuronal adequacy. I'll come back to that. Ben Libet uh, in, in the uh, late 70s actually did experiments on patients in surgery who were having brain surgery under local anesthetic. So they were awake and he could talk to them and record from their brain. And he figured out that it takes, if, if he gave a stimulus like to the finger and recorded from the finger area in the brain, it took 500 milliseconds of activity for there to be consciousness. So that's, and he called that neuronal adequacy. You needed a half a second of activity to, to reach consciousness, even if you had the consciousness at 30 milliseconds, which brings up this funny uh, time problem we'll come back to. And uh, so it also raised the question, what's special about the third wave? So when the information gets to the cortex, whether it's uh, from the thalamus or from other parts of the cortex, there's also three waves within cortex. And uh, from the thalamus, or this could also be from other areas of cortex, the, uh, the first wave in the cortex goes to four, layer four. There's six layers of cortex. And so you see that in the green. And then from layer four, we, it goes to one, two, three, and six in the yellow arrows. arrows. And then from one, two, three, and six, you see the red arrows converging on layer five, these giant pyramidal cells in the red. And they're quite literally shaped like a pyramid. And they are kind of the final, uh, final target of uh, uh, activity that leads to consciousness. And uh, they're, they're, very, they're very important, the pyramidal cells, and I'll come back to that. So presumably within the cortex, that's where consciousness occurs. Or let me put it this way, if I had to bet where in the brain consciousness is happening, I'd bet on layer five pyramidal cells. And uh, uh, there may be other areas too, but, but that's the most likely place. And the layer five pyramidal cells form a layer over the whole cortex. Uh, the cortex is like the size of a pizza, and then it gets folded into the fold so that it fits on the very top of our brain. And, um, um, Carl Prebrum, who was, uh, had a theory about holography, consciousness is holography, pointed out that these, that the pyramidal cells have these uh, basilar dendrites that, went, uh, that, that made like a web over the whole brain and had interference. And he thought that these, uh, these basilar dendritic webs uh, were the source of consciousness projecting a hologram. And I think that's actually a good idea, and we maybe. Uh, not today necessarily, but, but in general, coming back to something like that. Because uh, you have to ask the question, does consciousness come from axonal firings or from dendritic integration? And I'll, I'll come to that point in a minute. So let's look a little bit closer at the pyramidal cells. And there's a some important and interesting things about neurons in general that we can see here. 
So um, the neuron has a cell body or a soma, which is the pyramid, and it has dendrites that can be these basilar dendrites or the apical dendrite. The apical dendrite will go to the very top of the, of the cortex, and the apical dendrites give rise to EEG. And the basilar dendrites go laterally, and they make a web across the whole brain. So you can think of them as one organ, so to speak. And uh, uh, the dendrites and the soma, cell body, receive inputs, synaptic inputs, integrate them to a threshold, and that leads to firing along the axon. So the axon is going down, and the pyramidal cell axons go directly to the spinal cord in what are called the pyramidal tracts. So if you wanted a system that's going to give you as quick as possible action uh, from consciousness, it would be this, because it goes directly to the spinal cord to the, to the pyramidal tracts. A couple other things to notice here is that the microtubules, which we'll come to in a second, in the axon from this point down are continuous. They, they're not interrupted. They just go from here all the way down to the spinal cord, which can be a meter or more away. Whereas the microtubules in the cell body and the dendrites, and up to a certain point of the axon, are interrupted. And in mixed polarity, some point this way, some point that way. They're, they're mixed. And they're connected by these other, other proteins. And uh, the microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton, which implies that they're there for structural support. Um, but if you wanted them for structural support, you wouldn't want them broken. Uh, and interrupted. You want them solid to give you good, good structural support. And, uh, but yet, they're interrupted, and, and there's no good explanation for that, although Roger and I think we have an idea. I'll talk about that in a second. And the, the axon begins to function as an axon with an integrated, with a, an all or none uh, uh, action potential, a spike that goes all the way down. But that doesn't happen until here, where you get the changeover from the uh, interrupted microtubules to the continuous microtubules. This is called the axon initiation segment. And there's some special structures in there too, but the main point is that the microtubules change from being interrupted and uh, mixed polarity to being unipolar and continuous. And the other thing about, uh, I like to point out, is that the barrels in the center are, are the centriole. And all cells have centrioles. They're like the origin of the, of the uh, cytoskeleton. And in neurons, one of those barrels, which are made of microtubules, sticks out above, take, through the membrane, takes the membrane with it. It sticks out from the cell body of the pyramidal cell like an antenna. And nobody really knows what that's for either. So it's sensing something, but what exactly what nobody knows. So that's the pyramidal cell, which I think is the best bet for where consciousness happens. Now, modern science and philosophy generally sees the brain as a neuronal synaptic computer. So on the left, we see a bunch of neurons in kind of a tangle. And we know they make synaptic connections. And computer scientists and artificial intelligence proponents uh, have to say that this means that the brain is a computer. And like we see over on the right with nodes and connections. And if you make it com complex enough, you get complex enough computation that consciousness would happen. I don't think that's right. And these are made of what are called Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. Uh, Hodgkin-Huxley in the 1950s, uh, I'll show you some slides of that in a second, um, uh, figured out that neurons are what we call integrate and fire. So integrate means that the dendrites and, and cell body integrate synaptic inputs to a threshold and when that threshold is met, the axon fires. And most neuroscientists and computer scientists take the axonal firings as a one or a zero, as the bit of information in the brain. And that may not be right either. Anyway, here's the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, and you can see the, uh, yeah, there it is. You can see the cell body, you can see the various dendrites, and they're receiving information and integrating, and here's the axon, and somewhere along here would be the transition, the axon initiation segment, and once it reaches this point, it's gonna go all the way as, an a, as a spike, as an action potential, all the way to the next synapse, a layer of neurons further down. 
and all mediated, they say, by membrane events, by ion channels crossing the membrane that you see there. So they're ignoring everything inside the cell and just looking at the membrane and assuming the membrane and the ion channels and the synapses are doing everything that's important uh, for, for neuronal function. Integrate and fire, integrate and fire, integrate and fire. So Hodgkin-Huxley neurons are algorithmic, deterministic, and machine-like. There's no room or place or rationale for consciousness, creativity, <laughs> intuition, or insight. And so that's a problem. And it's too late for real-time conscious control and free will. So this is what it, 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 neuroscientists and philosophers who just look at the membrane are dealing with. Uh, activity that is great for doing non-conscious things, but there's no room for consciousness, uh, free will, intuition, creativity. So accordingly, consciousness is considered epiphenomenal. Epiphenomenal means uh, it's not causing anything, it's just along for the ride. And as T.H. Huxley said, uh, we are merely, we are conscious automata, merely helpless spectators, along for the ride. And the cartoon there is of a uh, video game called Pac-Man, and, and maybe uh, um, that was before some of your time, but it was one of the first video games that I remember playing. We have a joystick to move, move uh, this guy around, this guy, this guy here to eat these other guys, and they're moving around, and you go this way, this way, this way. So the operator, you or me or whoever's doing it, is, is controlling it, and the Pac-Man is just uh, along for the ride. And that's the analogy, that's what modern neuroscience has to say because of the fact that they're dealing with an al algorithmic neuron and uh, consciousness comes too late. So that's the, unfortunately, that's the, uh, if you follow the, the standard dogma, that's what it is. Is the brain really, oops, is the brain really a complex computer of Hodgkin-Huxley neurons? Is it really? Well, it may not be. So um, what we see on top is what's predicted by Hodgkin-Huxley. So in the gray would be the integration, and in the red would be the firing, the spikes. And this is on the, below that is a schematic uh, it's just linear, it doesn't have to be, of integration in a very narrow uh, temporal window of fire and a very narrow uh, threshold of voltage. So when you reach that voltage potential, you trigger a spike, a firing. So that's algorithmic according to Hodgkin-Huxley. That's what's predicted. And if you look at neurons uh, in, in culture, they do that. But if you look at a neuron in an awake animal that's, that's conscious, and this was done by Nondorf et al. in 2006, uh, in, in cats, they put electrodes into the pyramidal cells, and what they found was something different. They found that the, the firing threshold was quite broad. It basically changed from spike to spike. So one spike would, would be triggered at a critical, at one threshold. The next one would, be, uh, would have a different threshold. So there was something else going on that was controlling it. And what that means is that we have a wide voltage threshold here and a wide temporal window of when the, when the firing of the spike could occur, despite the, the threshold not, or no apparent reason for the uh, firing threshold to change. And uh, you can look at that as saying that some non-computable factor, uh, because Hodgkin-Huxley is, is a computer model of the brain, the neuron, some non-computable factor helps regulate firings or spikes. And the other thing that's interesting is that in the previous slide, you remember the red was kind of sloped because the ion channels and the axon were supposed to open sequentially, this one, this one, this one, this one. But in the awake animal, you see it's vertical, and that's because all of these ion channels open at the same time. And how they do that is another mystery. It, you can't really explain it by membrane effects. Uh-oh, I got a... Something about Tokyo Gas Free Wi-Fi wi -Fi Passport. Okay, 
It's gone. It might come back. It was just here. Okay, so there's some deviation from, thank you, Doug. There's some deviation from Hodgkin Huxley integrated in fire behavior. Some non computable factor regulates firings or spikes. And that would be a very convenient place for consciousness to come in. Because what's happening is, okay, you have normal uh, autopilot behavior, non conscious behavior, which most of the time is good enough. If you're, if you're walking or driving, you, don't, you might be daydreaming about something else, and, uh, and then all of a sudden you have to pay attention or become conscious of what you're doing, of what you're driving, uh, of, of your driving. And uh, this is, as I said, where consciousness can regulate behavior. This would be a very convenient place to, to take over uh, otherwise non-conscious activity. Well, where would that come from? Well, if it's coming from the outside, it would show up in the, in the membrane potential, so that wouldn't work. It has to be coming from a deeper level. For example, inside the neuron. And if we look inside the neuron, then we see the cytoskeleton. So here's a neuron. It's, it's basically the same idea. Here we see the, ax the axon with the microtubules continuous and, and uh, uh, going all the way down. And here are the microtubules of the dendrite, which are further back, so they look smaller. They're actually the same size. They're interrupted, and uh, they're receiving the, the input uh, and integrating it, and then uh, somehow triggering uh, the spike, the, the action potential. So Bing could be in the microtubules. Consciousness could be coming from that, overriding uh, the membrane effects to, to trigger the spike or not trigger the spike. So consciousness coming in and altering our behavior, maybe. So these would be deeper, faster, and possibly quantum processes in the cytoskeleton. And this is uh, analogous to uh, deep learning in artificial intelligence. Uh, so in, in AI, uh, over the past couple of decades, the big developments, is from my, my vantage point, are uh, back propagation, which can happen in the microtubules, and also uh, uh, deep learning. And deep learning has, has made a, uh, a big impact uh, on convolutional networks. And in deep learning, uh, in AI, you have a simple neural network and, they, and uh, a, a layer of networks, and then you add additional hidden layers in between, between the input layer and the output layer. And by adding those extra layers, uh, they provide aspect, they, they, they give deep learning AI systems a tremendous advantage. And uh, these have been applied to cognition. And uh, Anil Seth, for example, has, uh, has done this. And when you, when you have an additional level, uh, additional uh, deep learning coming from so, somewhere else uh, in, on a, another system, you get a mixture of different types of perceptions. So for example, this famous picture of, of dogs, puppy dogs, coming out of spaghetti. And uh, another one is uh, the Mona Lisa with eyeballs. Uh, I think those are eyeballs here, here and there. And people have, have made uh, the observation, this is kind of like what happens on, in uh, psychedelics, in halluc uh, hallucinogens. Uh, if you take LSD or ayahuasca or whatever, you, you get a kind of a blending of different perceptions and start to see things like this. And so this could have something to do with, with, uh, with, the, with that. Um, so the, uh, the hidden layer AI networks are the same scale. They're, they're, not what I'm they're not quite what I'm suggesting for microtubules because they're the same scale and they're connected serious, serially. But if you could put these extra layers uh, at a deeper level inside the other level and make them faster, then you could have a hierarchical system. And I think that that's, that's what's going on. So I don't think it's just adding more uh, networks. I think it's actually, you're adding the networks, but at a deeper level, going down and down and down in a hierarchy. So the question is, um, could microtubules inside brain neurons act like a hidden layer at smaller, faster scale? I'm, I'm going to say yes, why not? <coughs> and uh, if you look at the neuron, instead of just looking at the, the membrane, look at inside, here we see a synapse, 
and the microtubules are interrupted. And on the, over here, we see the microtubules and uh, showing their ability to process information. So microtubules are polymers, they're cylindrical polymers made up of individual proteins, these tubules that are peanut shaped. And uh, they interact, they're in hexagonal lattice and they interact with their neighbors and can be in at least two states, probably more, but for simplicity we're showing uh, uh, two states here. And we get patterns and propagation. And uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s, I did a lot of modeling of, of microtubules as classical computers like this, classical automata. Well, can microtubules process information? Well, apparently they can. For example, if you look at a, uh, a single cell paramecium, uh, it's one cell. It can learn, it can avoid predators, it can find food, it can find a mate, it can have sex. Uh, there are no synapses, it's one cell. And over on the right, uh, we see two paramecium having sex. And uh, it's kind of an X-rated slide, I apologize mm. for that. And uh, you know, we don't, I'm not saying they're conscious, although they could be conscious. Um, uh, but the point is they do clever things, like bounce off of things and go another way. If you suck them into a capillary tube, <laughs> they escape faster each time, uh, so they can learn and uh, they can store memory. So um, how do they do that? Well, they do it through microtubule-based structures called cilia. So if you see these little hairs sticking out, they're actually uh, made up of microtubules. We'll come back to them. And they actually bend and move. They can act as oars to, to make the paramecium swim, or as sensors to detect things. So if it runs into this, it's going to uh, bend one of these, or a bunch of these, and goes in. And it's, it goes into the uh, cytoskeleton and it's coordinated and it decides to go in another direction. So the, the microtubules are kind of like the, the nervous system of the cilia, so, um, uh, of the paramecium, uh, particularly the cilia. So on the top here we see a paramecium, and you can see the cilia sticking out. Upper right we see a cross section through a cilia, and uh, each of those, those circles are a microtubule, and we have nine on the, on the, around the perimeter, and one pair, nine pairs of them, and then one pair in the middle. And they stick out from the cell, as you see here. And uh, they, here's the cross-section of doublets. They can also be triplets in a slightly different form called a centriole. And this is the centriole here, so you see triplets, you have nine of them. And uh, so cilia and centrioles uh, are the same size and have nine doublets or triplets of microtubules which also makes them the right size to be optical waveguides and capture photons, which uh, I'll come back to later. So how do they, how do they move in a coordinated fashion, fashion? So there we see the cross-section of the cilium, and they have these motor proteins called dyne that in this case go between uh, the different doublets, and they bend in an organized fashion. So if you imagine the signal going down this microtubule, it, says, okay, you bend down, then you bend, and then you bend, so that they bend in an organized fashion and can do uh, functional activities. Okay, well, what does that have to do with the brain? It turns out it has a lot to do with the brain because the same thing is going on inside the brain, inside each and every neuron, each, each and every of our neurons. So this paper uh, was about synaptic plasticity and as you know, synapses, so here's the, here's the cell body, this is the axon, dendrites, here's the dendrite, and these are synapses out here. And in learning, you have to upregulate or downregulate synapses. It could be anywhere. So if you want to, if you're learning, you need to make this one more sensitive. Uh, you need to get more proteins down there, more receptors and so forth. So learning involves getting specific material to a specific synapse. And those materials are synthesized in the cell body and have to get there. They're transported by these motor proteins, either kinesin or dynein that you see up there. The same uh, motor proteins that are found in the cilia and in the paramecium. And uh, you can see that they're carrying a cargo. And here, they're, this one's getting off. So let's say a synapse right here needs more dopamine decarboxylase or some enzyme or some neurotransmitter. 
Well, the motor protein has to know to deliver its cargo, like a postal address. And, and so it, it turns out the tau proteins uh, are the signals for where to get off and deliver its protein, uh, to, deliver the, to deliver the cargo. So it, it's, this is basically memory because it, it's telling the motor protein uh, where to go to deliver the uh, material to fortify a particular synapse. So that's really learning and memory. Now, what happens if we lose this ability? Or, wait a second. What if the motor protein transport is defective? Well, that can happen, actually. And uh, here's one example, or many examples. The transport of this particular protein that has to do with uh, uh, active bundling, bundling uh, uh, is normally, this, it's transported properly and results in proper F active bundling and proper morphology. However, if there's a defect, uh, defective transport of CRMP2 leads to dispersed F active and abnormal shapes of neurons, shown here, in schizophrenia. And uh, I reviewed a paper from 2016 about uh, the cytoskeleton and psychiatric diseases. And most of the psychiatric diseases that have been uh, identified in terms of their pathology have problems in their cytoskeleton. And schizophrenia is one of them. The neurons in schizophrenia are misshapen. They're, they're not symmetrical like they should. They, they, they just look funny. <coughs> their, their shape is wrong. And it could be because of this F-actin, which is a function of microtubule transport. And there are many other examples of problems uh, with the cytoskeleton leading to um, uh, mental and cognitive disorders. So that raises the question of whether microtubules can actually process information. And because they're, they're polymers of individual proteins, and each protein, the tubulin, can be of one, of one or two states, it gives you the possibility for a, a computer, basically or what, as we modeled it in the 80s, the game of life. The game of life was a cellular automata uh, that ran, it was a column in, in Scientific American run by a Martin Gardner. And uh, if you have a very simple grid, just a checkerboard, and each, each uh, square can be one of two states, and you only interact by neighbor states, you can get patterns that propagate through the lattice and can do fairly complex things. So with my, uh, my colleague Steen Rasmussen uh, from Denmark in, in 1990, we did a model, we did a simulation and showed the patterns, uh, uh, we basically ran the game of life on a microtubule, uh, which is a cylindrical lattice, so you get wraparound effects, and we got patterns that propagated uh, through the microtubule and could, could, uh, could learn. We showed that uh, you, you could do learning too. <laughs> and so we published uh, a bunch of papers about classical computing and microtubules in the 80s that you can see here. And then when I started working with Roger, uh, quantum, computing, quantum computing in microtubules in the 90s and, and more recently. So if you think, okay, well, maybe this is right, maybe each tubulin can be a bit, and uh, how would that change uh, brain computational capacity? Well, if you forget about microtubules and just look at the top, uh, this is what uh, AI would say, I think. This is what uh, Kurzweil was saying. It was actually first said by Hans Morbeck in 1986, looking at the capacity of the brain. Uh, so we know there are about 100 billion neurons, 86 billion, or let's say 100, with about 1,000 synapses per neuron, at switching at about 100 hertz. That gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. So Kurzweil from the, the Singularity said, well, when we reach, when computers in silicon reach 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain, then we will have equivalents of, uh, of, of, of the brain capacity in a computer, and the computer should do everything the brain can do, including consciousness. So he, he was saying, you know, give us another few billion dollars and we'll have a conscious computer. We just need to reach 10 to the 16th operations per second. Well, I think that's come and gone and they're still not conscious. Um, and here's one, one reason why, not the only reason. Uh, if you look at the level of microtubules uh, and say, you know, same 10 to the 11th neurons, you have about a billion tubules per neuron. And they're switching not at a thousand uh, or a hundred hertz, but at 
let's say 10 megahertz. And why that is, I'll tell you in a second. So um, that gives you uh, 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron. Per neuron, not for the whole brain, per neuron. And therefore, 10 to the 27th operations per second for the brain. So this pushed the goalpost for where computers had to be to match the brain, if, if this is right, way, way downstream. Move the goalpost, as we say in America, football. Uh, and so the AI and singularity people didn't like that very much. And uh, when I would go around to meetings and say, hey, your, your, your goal is way further down. You're, you're being way too simplistic. They said, oh, get out of here. Go away. We don't, we don't want to hear this. But then um, one day somebody said to me, okay, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? You have all this computation, but how does that explain feelings, love, joy, a toothache, uh, quaya, all that, consciousness, what later became known as the hard problem. Um, and I didn't have a good answer. I said, I don't know. That's a very good question. Well, fortunately, that person, and I don't remember who it was, recommended I read Roger's book that I've, I've seen here, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, which I did. And I was fascinated by it. And, uh, and also later, Shadows of the Mind. Um, but it was The Emperor's New Mind that really was the new, uh, new idea. And uh, he said that uh, you need something else. You need something non-computable, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, as they were saying, where's consciousness? Where's the being? Is something else required? And is that quantum physics? Why don't you go read Roger's book, which I did. So here it is, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, Concerning Computers, Minds, and the Law of Physics. And I hadn't really paid much attention to uh, uh, quantum, uh, but uh, I started paying attention to it. And uh, uh, it's hard to explain, so let me give you a very simple explanation uh, the, using the yin-yang. That is that our world is divided into two realms, the quantum and the classical. And the quantum, well, I'll start with the classical at the bottom. It, it's what we, we recognize. Uh, everything is, is in one place, uh, like particles, and fairly large. But if we go down in, in scale to the quantum, below a certain level, and, if, and the particular level, we don't know, that's the problem. You get quantum superposition, where things can be in two places at the same time. Two states or two places, actually separated from itself. More like a wave than a particle. Also, they can be non-local, they can be connected over great distances and they act like waves and they tend to be small. So um, it turns out that consciousness actually, I think, exists on the edge of the boundary between the quantum and classical worlds. But exactly how is the, is the question. But in quantum superposition, a particle can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities or as a particle in a definite state or location. So here's a, here's a cesium atom in the yellow and here we see it as a particle. But depending on how, on how it's being observed or not being observed, it can be a wave, as you see in the background. So those, those are two ways of describing the same thing, the same cesium atom, as a wave or as a particle. We tend to see things as particles. We don't see them as waves. But we know from uh, uh, experiments that they can be waves. Uh, multiple particles can have uh, when in the, in the wave-like uh, form, they can have quantum coherence, which is a unitary oneness similar to living systems, kind of quantum vitalism. You know, the self, the unitary, uh, unitary self, there's only one of us. Or in, in binding, you know, if you remember uh, the back of the brain going forward, so shape, color, motion, meaning are, are processed in different parts of visual cortex, and yet, we don't see something's shape, then it's color, then it's motion, then it's meaning. We see something and know, oh, that's a kite, or that's an airplane, or that's a bird, or that's whatever. We see it all at once, and it's unified. And one way that that can happen is through coherence and, and binding, where things become unified both in space and in time. We only measure part, we only observe particles. The, and that seems to be related to the fact that the act of measurement or of conscious observation seems to collapse the wave function. Just looking at it or measuring it. And this is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Now when uh, Niels Bohr and other uh, quantum pioneers uh, realized that things could be in waves but they only saw particles, um, 
they decided that, some people decided that uh, conscious observation caused collapse of the wave function. So just looking at it, at the wave, caused the wave to become a particle and caused the wave to decide whether to be here or there, what, what particular particle to be. And uh, so here we see uh, our observer, this guy here, looking at uh, Schrodinger's cat. So Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, thought that this idea was crazy uh, because he came up with this thought experiment to show how absurd it was. He said you could, you could couple a quantum particle, say out here, outside this box, like a, a, a photon going through a half silver mirror, uh, so it's going to uh, go through and be reflected. And because it's a quantum particle, it just goes through and it's reflected. So you, you've made it into a quantum particle. And if, it go, if it's reflected, it's going to go in this box, and that's going to swing this hammer, break this vial. There's poison in it. The poison's going to leak out and kill the cat. So Schrodinger said this idea that consciousness causes collapse is crazy because it means that the cat would be both dead and alive until somebody opened the box and took a look. And uh, nobody, uh, there's still not a very good explanation, but he, he used that as an example of why uh, this conscious observer idea wasn't very good. Uh, there's also decoherence that environmental interaction disrupts quantum super, coherent superposition. Uh, but really, it just the superposition persists. It's just buried in noise. Other people think that there is no collapse, there is no reduction, that every possible possibility of superposition continues, and we have an infinite number of universes. This is the many worlds or, or uh, multiple universe hypothesis, mm -hmm. and we have an infinite number of parallel universes. There's some artist's rendition of what that might look like. Then another possibility was put forth by Roger Penrose, who suggested that, um, uh, other people did too, in different ways, that reduction, quantum state reduction, or collapse of the wave function occurred due to an objective threshold in the fine scale structure of the universe. This is what I read about in The Emperor's New, uh, in, uh, yeah, the Emperor's New Mind, and it was pretty mind blowing. It was, it was kind of hard to really understand, but the more I thought about it, the more, the more it seemed to make sense. And that such objective reduction, self-collapse, produced consciousness. This was a real, a real kicker. And, uh, but, but to get there, let me back up. You first had to account for superposition. How do you explain something being in two or more places at the same time? It's really pretty uh, illogical. Well, he turned to general relativity, Einstein's general relativity. And Einstein had noted that, that matter uh, was related to curvature in fundamental space-time geometry. And for example, for, for large particles, like the sun. So here, here we see the sun. And around it, we see uh, space-time that's curved due to the mass of the sun. And Einstein said, well, according to this, if there's a star behind the sun, we ought to be able to see it uh, if we get blot out the sun, like in an eclipse, uh, because space-time would curve it to where, to where we see it. If we look at it directly, you'd have to look to the sun. But if it was bent around the sun, we'd see it. We'd think it was over there, but we would see it nonetheless. So in 1919, uh, Arthur Eddington did the experiment from a mountaintop during an eclipse and showed that this was right. And, and uh, he won a Nobel Prize. Uh, Einstein had already, had already won it for something else. So that's for large particles. And Roger, in The Emperor's New Mind, equated quantum particles with tiny space-time curvatures at tiny scales. So rather than something gigantic like the sun, he was talking about a, a particle, uh, maybe an electron or a proton, or, or maybe even, uh, uh, some, some kind of particle. And he, took, he made uh, two-dimensional space-time curvatures. So he condensed three uh, dimensions of space to one, and then one dimension of time, so he could write down a two-dimensional space-time sheet on a piece of paper. And a particle, uh, with it here would be a curvature here, and if it was over here, it would be a curvature you'd see up there. So if the particle's oscillating, the, the space-time curvatures would oscillate uh, between the two configurations. And superposition then would be uh, both curvatures, and you'd have uh, separated space-time curvature we see on, on the right. And this, when you put it this way, it's called a qubit or quantum bit, because you have two possibilities, and a superposition of both possibilities. 
And if you go from what's on the right to the left, that's uh, collapsed to one or the other. So you have separated space-time curvature, and that allowed him to deal with, with the idea of, of superposition. Now, you might imagine that if these separations were to continue, then each one would form its own universe. And so the multiple worlds people uh, would say, well, what happens is each possibility, each curvature continues and has its own universe. So here we have universe one and universe two. And, uh, and then they just continue on that way. But let's go back to the idea that consciousness causes collapse that was put forth by von Neumann, Wigner, Staff, more recently David Chalmers and Kelvin McQueen, who say that consciousness causes quantum state uh, reduction. Consciousness collapses the wave function. So over here we have uh, a conscious entity, Bing, in his, his or her brain, looking at the superposition and the conscious observation causes this possibility to discontinue and this one to continue. So it's causing collapse of the wave function and choosing this possibility. And we're calling this subjective reduction because the subject, subjective nature of his or her experience causes the collapse. So he was describing superposition as opposing space-time curvatures. Um, but the difference was, Roger said that rather than each one forming its own universe or needing an observer to come in, because then you'd have to explain the observer's consciousness, and you'd have, so it's really dualist. You're putting the observer outside of science. He said that the separation is unstable and will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction, OR, at time, at time t given by h bar over e sub g, which is basically the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. And the time is when it would happen. H is actually h bar, Planck's uh, the Planck Dirac constant. And E sub G is the gravitational self energy, uh, the energy uh, required to pull a particle uh, from itself, to separate a particle from itself, or separate space time curvature. So the more mass you have separated from itself, the greater the E sub G, and the faster it will reach collapse. So a large superposition will collapse quickly, a small superposition will take a long time. So he was turning around the, the idea that consciousness causes, causes collapse. He was saying that rather than that, collapse occurs spontaneously and causes consciousness. Collapse causes consciousness rather than consciousness causes collapse. Or that collapse is consciousness. So he was turning this around from uh, the conscious observer at the top, causing consciousness to not needing a conscious observer to, to it happening spontaneously and giving rise to consciousness. So he was describing consciousness as a process intrinsic to the fine scale structure of the universe and a solution to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So killing two birds with one stone, you might say, solving two problems with one. And uh, he and I have been ridiculed for that. Uh, David Chalmers called, said that we were invoking the myth of mythical Law of, uh, law of minimization of mysteries. And uh, I said, well, that's pretty clever, Dave, but why not? I mean, it, it could be the same mystery. It could be related. So we don't know the answer to that, but, but I, I, th I think uh, this makes the most sense to me. Anyway, if this happens in a random environment, like there's quantum, uh, quantum things going on in this, in this uh, table, in the air, everywhere, in a random environment, such events would be isolated and lack meaning and context they would be proto-conscious. So this is kind of like panpsychism, which says that everything has a little bit of consciousness. According to this, to be events happening everywhere all the time that have a little bit of consciousness. Um, but they would, be, uh, they would be isolated and lack meaning and context. They would happen and there'd be no memory. They wouldn't talk to their neighbors. They'd just, they'd just go on and it wouldn't have any impact. And I, I like the metaphor that, but they would still have some subjectivity, some qualia, some phenomenal experience, even if it's very simple and disconnected. And if you go to the symphony and the musicians are warming up before the performance, each of them is, is tuning their instrument. We hear these, these tones and notes and sounds uh, like a cacophony. It's noise. It's not music. And then the, music, then the orchestra begins to play, and that's music. And that's what we need in the brain. We need something to organize and to orchestrate these protoconscious moments into something more like a symphony, except we can't have a conductor. It has to be more spontaneous, more uh, imp imp improv. So how could they be organized or orchestrated in the brain for full, rich, conscious experience? 
So when I read his book, when I read Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, I realized that he was he needed a quantum quantum computer in the brain, which which could biologically orchestrate quantum information processing, halt or terminate by Penrose OR at a time t equals h over uh, uh, h over e sub g, connecting to non-computable platonic values. He also said that that the selection wouldn't be random, but would be inf influenced by information embedded in the universe and, uh, and connecting to these qualia to give rise to, to consciousness. And they had to regulate neuronal uh, mm -hmm. and synaptic function. So they have to be in the brain, they had to be able to, uh, to influence the neuron, uh, but still be isolated for quantum. Um, but I thought, having studied, at that point, having studied microtubules for 20 years, that they were the best bet for what he was looking for. So I wrote to Roger and suggested it, and he liked the idea. and. Uh, we soon teamed up. Um, I invited him to the first, well, we met at a conference. Well, I, we met in his office and we met at another conference. And then I invited him to the first Tucson conference. Were you at the first? You weren't at the first one. Uh, probably not. Maybe the second one? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. 94, you were in 94. Yeah, 1994. Nah, oh, well, actually, I might have been in 94. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It was at that, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Afterwards, I didn't know you then, but afterwards, uh, uh, I, well, I kind of bribed Roger to come by promising him a trip to the Grand Canyon, and which is where we went. And there's, there's Dave Chalmers, and there's Roger, and there's me in the back. And we started talking about how this could you know, become a theory. And um, one of the things that's come out of it um, is, and I'll, I'll come back to that, some of the specifics in a second, but um, it, it, it requires not just a deeper level that I talked about before, like a deep learning, but a hierarchical level that starts the level of neurons. Now, there are many ideas of scale invariant hierarchies or multi-scale hierarchies in the brain, starting from neurons, but then going larger into uh, EEG and then faster EEG. So going upwards in size uh, in the EEG. And, but also, we need to go downward in, in size and up in frequency uh, faster. So, um, and there's actually evidence for this that I'll, I'll come to in a second. But uh, about a thousand, uh, a thousand times faster you get to uh, networks of microtubules, a million times faster you get to individual microtubules, a billion times faster you get to these rows of tubulins with dipoles, uh, and then 10 to the 12 terahertz, you get, you get into the aromatic rings in the tubulin, which have uh, quantum dipoles, at 10 to the 15th, you have uh, uh, terahertz, high terahertz, with the dipole oscillation. This is where anesthesia acts to block these dipole oscillations, to take away consciousness. At 10 to the 18th, you get uh, nuclei separated from themselves. And then skipping over, you go all the way down, and eventually you get to the fine scale, to Roger's space-time curvature. So it's a hierarchy that starts in the brain and goes uh, at least down to the level of terahertz in the brain, and then maybe all the way down to, to the Planck scale. So this is the same thing, except the first half of it, you can maybe see it a little bit better, going from the level of neurons down to the microtubules and into the rows of tubulin, and then uh, from tubulin into the high resonance dipoles, nuclei, and then all the way down to alternate space-time curvature. Okay, well, uh, we put out our theory in, uh, 95, 96, and we started getting criticized even before we had published it, because we've been talking about it, and everybody said, well, everybody knows the brain's too warm, wet, and noisy for quantum effects, forget about it. And uh, because if you build a quantum computer in the laboratory, it has to be at absolute zero temperature, near absolute zero, because any thermal vibration is gonna mess it up. So uh, that's what we were told, but we figured, well, biology has had a couple billion years to figure this out, probably smarter than you guys, so let's just, let's just find out. We don't know yet. So it turned out the answer is in organic chemistry, the, the basis of, of, of basic chemistry of life. And uh, uh, chemists in the 1700s knew that there were these alkanes, uh, hydrocarbons, and alkenes uh, that have a double bond. And they, all, they knew the formula, you can see them at the very top. But then they had this molecule, C6H6, and they didn't know what it was because it didn't fit the formula. And Kegeli, a German chemist, uh, had a dream one night where the hydrocarbons were like snakes, and one snake swallowed its tail. And that's a mythical thing called the Ouroboros, uh, making a loop or a ring. 
And he woke and said, aha, benzene is a ring. It's got six carbons, and they're connected in a ring, a hexagonal ring. There's three extra electrons. And what happens to those three electrons? It's usually the sum and written like that. So the three extra electrons were for the, for the problem. What do they do? Well, it turns out what they do is very important. The extra electrons form uh, high resonance clouds, electron clouds, above and below the ring. And this is a, a quantum object, essentially. So the electrons form this, uh, this cloud of demobilized electrons that forms basically a quantum object where it's just the electrons are distributed throughout that whole volume. And these can support electric and magnetic dipole oscillation, excitons, charge transfer, photons, fluorescence, all kinds of quantum effects. Uh, so it raises the question, do light and consciousness derive from high resonance and biomolecules? And I think light does also. Um, but a couple of things about these rings. Uh, it, they're neutral, they're nonpolar, so there's no charge. They don't do a lot of chemistry. That's why a lot of chemists aren't, don't do this kind of, kind of chemistry because there's no charges to transfer and that sort of thing. But the electron clouds, if they get close enough, the electrons in one repel the electrons in the other, and they form these dipoles. And the dipoles attract like little bar magnets, and then they oscillate back and forth in terahertz. And they, they go to this, this distance called the Van der Waals radius, and when they're at the Van der Waals radius, they oscillate in terahertz. Now, if you put all a bunch of benzene together, you get, you get gasoline, and it's explosive. But if you put it in, a, in, in a, like a crystal array, and they tend to go that way uh, naturally, they space themselves out, and you get quantum effects. And graphene and fullerenes are also examples of this. So they attract and they oscillate in terahertz, and this is where anesthesia, we know that anesthesia acts uh, by the same type of mechanism, forming its own uh, inter dipole interactions, which disperse the dipoles and stop the oscillation. So in a nutshell, in consciousness, we need these oscillations in this quantum superposition. But if you add anesthesia, it stops the oscillations, and you lose consciousness. And then you get rid of the anesthesia, and it comes back. OK, well, what about in, in the brain? What about in microtubules? Well, here's a, uh, a tubule, and I've been showing you pictures of it as a, as a peanut. Uh, it, when the, uh, the uh, chemical structure, the atomic structure was discovered in uh, uh, 99, I think, and uh, we saw that there were 86 of these aromatic rings. So just like I showed you before with the dipole oscillations, and including eight tryptophan, which is a lot for protein this size. And here's where they're located, and the red spheres are where anesthetics bind. So there's 86 pi resonance rings, including uh, eight tryptophans. And uh, uh, Travis Craddock in this study, uh, we did uh, a model of them and, and, and found that uh, uh, the interaction of the 86 gave a, a spectrum of terahertz that was pretty complicated uh, for, for one tubulin. And uh, here's, here's that paper. And uh, the anesthesia, if you, if you model the anesthetic in there also, it took away the, the uh, terahertz oscillation. So we put this forward as a theory of, of anesthesia and uh, based on computer modeling. And now we've done some actual experiments, too. I should also mention that uh, psychoactive molecules, including neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, and also the psychedelics, LSD, DMT, psilocybin, and others, all have these aromatic rings. So pretty much all the psychoactive molecules have uh, aromatic rings. and. Uh, uh, the, and, and seem to be related somehow to mental states. Um, the aromatic rings are also found in, throughout nature, for example, in, uh, in photosynthesis. And one of the big breakthroughs in getting past the idea that the brain was too warm, wet, noisy was in 2006 when it was discovered that photosynthesis, by which plants uh, collect light in the light harvesting complex up there and transfer it through this FMO protein where it's converted to chemical energy to make food, and then we eat the plants, or the animals eat the plants, we eat the animals, and so forth. So without this being very efficient, we might not exist. So how does this energy get transferred, the, the photon energy get transferred to chemical energy efficiently? Well, it turns out that the, the energy is converted to excitons, uh, 
and propagate through all seven of these aromatic groups simultaneously in superposition. And without this very efficient uh, uh, processing, we wouldn't have uh, the food that uh, it wouldn't work. We, we might not exist. So jumping ahead to microtubules, since each of these tubulin had a bunch of these aromatic rings, and there's actually 86 of them, but I've just uh, shown like nine of them here. And in these, these pathways, they can align, like I showed before, and, uh, and oscillate the dipole. So the yellow, the dipole's going that way, the blue is going this way, and we get a superposition of, uh, of both over on the right. So this is called a quantum bit or a qubit, which you need for a, a quantum computer. Um, so the basic idea in our theory is that you have enough uh, superposition. Remember, we want to uh, get the, uh, e sub g equals uh, uh, e sub g equals h over t, or t equals a, uh, either either way you look at it. And when it reaches the threshold here, there's a Bing moment, and there's the schematic, and it's actually due to space-time curvature at a much much lower level. So uh, that's the basic idea that you reach this threshold and you have a conscious moment. Uh, it's more than just one microtubulin. It's actually 10 to the 15th tubulins in the brain, uh, which is, and there's about 10 to the 20th tubulins in the brain. And, but it happens at time t equals h, h bar over e sub e. We've calculated how many tubulins you need for a uh, period, for a various uh, period of time to reach a uh, threshold for consciousness. So let me just uh, go over some numbers here. Quantifying orco R, we assume uh, 10 to the 8th and 10 to the 9th tubulins per neuron, 10 to the 19th and 10 to the 20th tubulins per human brain by e, e sub e equals h bar over t. So for example, uh, for if we say t is 100 milliseconds, like an alpha EEG rhythm, cognition EEG range, um, this would be a very long time to avoid decoherence. This is, what we, this is how we started out, but we realized it's too long for decoherence, and we wouldn't require very, very many neurons. However, we go to very, uh, a faster, uh, uh, shorter t time t, you need more E sub g, so at 10 meg megahertz, favor favorably short decoherence time, you don't have to avoid decoherence for 10 to the minus seven seconds, and you'd need about 10 to the 15th tubulins, which is about a 10,000th uh, of, of the brain. And that seems about right, maybe, for one conscious moment. So, uh, but it's too fast for cognition and consciousness because uh, our cognitive epochs are like hundreds of milliseconds. But interference patterns, <coughs> and Roger came up with this idea for a 2014 paper, interference patterns from terahertz to gigahertz to megahertz to kilohertz could resonate and evolve to reach threshold at time t. So, in fact, we predicted that the EEG was actually beat frequencies over uh, beat frequencies are much faster. So is, is there any evidence for this? Well, actually there is, it turns out. And this is the work of Anurban Bandipati, who is uh, uh, working at the, uh, the National Institute of Material Sciences in Suba, and I'm gonna visit him uh, next week, actually. And he, he did this work uh, over a series of papers beginning in 2013, and he, was, he did it because he read uh, our, uh, some of our, our papers and decided to test it. And so uh, he looked at microtubules, at three scales. So if you look at the top, you can see uh, two neurons, uh, one and two, and with uh, what were six uh, nanoprobes measuring in different places. And uh, and then here you see one microtubule with, with ten electrodes, and here you see some tubules with, with four electrodes. So it's looking at microtubule at three different scales. In all cases, if you uh, try, the microtubule is a very poor conductor. It's a good insulator. Um, but if you put in alternating current at different frequencies, you'll find a specific frequency where all of a sudden the microtubule becomes highly conductive. And he plotted that, and what he found was that every three orders of magnitude, you'd get a highly conductive area at uh, starting at, uh, at the fastest in the tubulin, the terabits. And they gave these patterns called triplets of triplets, three peaks, and each peak had three peaks. So we call them uh, triplets of triplets or octaves. And you got one in terahertz, gigahertz, and megahertz, the level of individual tubulins. 
when he went to an individual microtubule, he got the same, he got the same patterns as gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. And when he went to the neurons at the top, uh, he got at the level of megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. So he was getting the same pattern, uh, triplets of triplets, from stimulating at specific frequencies <coughs> over how many orders of magnitude, uh, 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 basically 15 orders of magnitude, from terahertz, high terahertz, to, to, uh, to zero hertz or one hertz. So um, this is actually evidence for, for that. And uh, we've, we've been doing more experiments now. And for example, uh, as part of the Templeton Project Accelerating Research into Consciousness, our group uh, has done quantum optical experiments on microtubules and ambient temperature. And Arad Kalra and Greg Scholes at Princeton have done tryptophan fluorescence lifetimes in tubular microtubules. <coughs> and basically, if you excite with, with UV, a uh, particular place on the microtubule, uh, something propagates, it's an electronic uh, energy transfer, eight tubulins, and then it emits down there. And uh, the prediction by the Forster uh, transmission was only uh, six, six nanometers, but we actually go 80, uh, uh, eight times, eight, 64 nanometers, so 10 times longer in the experiment than what was predicted. So there's something else going on, probably a quantum effect. And when we add anesthesia to this, uh, it goes away. So uh, this was just reported. We're writing it up now. We hope to get it published uh, hopefully fairly soon. It's going to go to a really good journal, and we'll see how that goes. And in another set of experiments at the University of Central Florida in RSD Bugardia's lab, um, microtubules were illuminated with brief visible light. So the other was, was uh, UV, and this is just uh, very brief uh, visible light, and they exhibited delayed luminescence, microtubules did, um, giving off lower, lower energy photons for over a second. So they kept on, uh, these photons bounced around the microtubule and kept getting emitted for up to a second. And uh, uh, this looked like a, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly how to describe this, and one of the uh, best possibilities is what's called super radiance, and Travis Craddock published this before we got these results. And actually, back in the 94, uh, uh, I published along with Carl Prebrum and uh, two Japanese, uh, Mari Jibu and Kunio Yasui, on super radiance and microtubules, although the, the, the mechanism was different. But anyway, uh, super radiance means that a photon, which if you think about it, is say 500 nanometers, and microtubule is way longer, it actually sits and gets and actually sits on a microtubule and is trapped, trapped there for a long time, like maybe a second. So this is also a quantum effect. And this could, uh, this, and, and this also goes away with anesthesia. So uh, we're gonna be doing this experiment in the gas phase and then writing that up too. So um, compared to other, uh, I'm gonna kind of wrap up here. Uh, compared to other theories of consciousness, OR has more supportive evidence Basically, we have some and they don't have any, I don't think, uh, specific uh, for anesthesia, for example. More explanatory power, because we can explain binding and, and the heart problem, potentially, and, and so forth. And we can solve the backward time, we can solve the, the consciousness comes too late, I'll come back to that. And we're more connected to biology, because the other, the other theories are just wiring diagrams of what's going on in the brain. Some other things worth mentioning, briefly, is that uh, you can ask the question, well, which came first, life or consciousness? And most people would say that life came first and then the brain got sufficiently complex, consciousness happened. But you could also, if you believe Penrose or Eastern philosophy, you could say that consciousness was there first. And I wrote this paper that said that consciousness actually happened uh, that in the primordial soup where life uh, supposedly uh, began, that it was prompted by primitive consciousness and primitive feelings of, of pleasure. Uh, Ken mentioned the, the quantum pleasure principle, and I coined that term in this paper, that you could actually have. So if you wanted a system to develop and, uh, and grow and proliferate, uh, you need some kind of feedback fitness function, and feeling good is, would be the best way to, to do that. <coughs> so maybe that's true. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that microtubules have coherent resonances in 
as I said, terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. And uh, if you could stimulate with uh, any of those, you might be able to influence microtubules in, in, a, in a beneficial way. Uh, well, terahertz is hard to get in the brain. Uh, gigahertz is microwaves, uh, no thank you, into my brain. Uh, megahertz, radio frequency, no thank you. But megahertz in mechanical waves is ultrasound. And uh, as an anesthesiologist, I've used ultrasound for a long time and know it to be safe. And uh, when I, I saw this, when Anurban discovered this, I looked and saw that ultrasound was approved for brain imaging and had been uh, tried in animals and gotten physiological effects and no ill effects. And so uh, I tr try to convince my anesthesia colleagues that we should try it on chronic pain patients who are depressed. And they said, well, we don't try anything on anybody else until we try it on ourselves first. Your idea, you got a shaved head, <coughs> go ahead. So one day at the end of a long day in the OR, I, uh, they were sitting around the table, I said, okay, I'll do it. So I put the thing up to my head like this for about 15, we have to put this gel on so you get a good contact. Held it for about 15 seconds and I didn't feel anything and I was really disappointed. However, about a minute later, I started to feel something and I got like a buzz for about an hour and a half. And I felt really good, and I felt energized, and I was thinking very clearly, and I said, uh, we should try this. So we did the first uh, study on men, uh, human mental states, and, and it happened to be in chronic pain patients, showed a, a beneficial effect in a double-blind double study, and published that in Brain Stimulation in 2013. It was a fairly primitive study, and I began to collaborate with others uh, since then, including Jay Sanguinetti and John Allen. We published a bunch of stuff. and. Uh, um, there have been recent reports that uh, ultrasound, transcranial ultrasound, uh, across, the, across the skull, improves Alzheimer's in humans in, and can affect, uh, uh, help uh, traumatic uh, brain injury. And in, in uh, 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 cell studies, like here, promotes neurite regeneration if you cut it. So it's, it could be working, I was, it's probably working by promoting microtubules to reassemble. So we want to do some studies on, uh, on ultrasound for uh, Alzheimer's, brain trauma, and uh, PTSD, and some other things. Okay, another study I want to mention by Anurban in the Journal of uh, uh, Neurophysiology, where he put, he put uh, um, these probes, uh, dielectric resonance probes, inside neurons in culture, and he could measure the megahertz and the, and the uh, gigahertz, and he found that the megahertz and gigahertz in the, in the dendrites and, and soma influence the firing here and also the firing in these other neurons more so than did the membrane. And he called this, he said that these were hidden circuits that were controlling things at a deeper level. And this is exactly what uh, I'd suggest it might be happening with the non experiments. And uh, more recently, Anurban has been measuring uh, like a special EEG from the scalp and is able to de detect this megahertz and gigahertz from the scalp buried in the EEGs, uh, not normal electrodes. Uh, but uh, I th we're, uh, he just did a study on 200 patients and uh, he was going to report on their EEG. So I think this is going to revolutionize uh, neuroscience and EEG in general because we're going to realize that we have these, these levels of, of activity going down uh, well below the uh, level of neurons and increasingly faster and faster uh, at smaller levels. Another question, where is memory stored? Um, synaptic, everybody says LT, you know, long-term potentiation, uh, synaptic proteins uh, mediate memory, uh, but those synaptic proteins only last hours to days and then they're gone, and yet memories can last lifetimes. So each tubulin can have one of 17 different genetic isoforms, up to five different post-translational modifications, phosphorylation, et cetera. So each tubulin in a neuron, and it's 10 to the ninth per neuron, can have two times 10 to the 22nd possible states. And you have a, a mosaic, a heterogeneous mosaic, to store enormous amounts of memory. Now one thing that's interesting about the microtubules and the dendrites that make them perfect for memory is that all other microtubules have to be able to disassemble, repurpose for mitosis, or do something else. But neurons don't divide. So once the microtubules uh, have, have done mitosis, they can stick to one thing. And in dendrites, they're capped at both ends. So they're going to maintain their lattice 
relationships and they can store memory uh, indefinitely for, for a lifetime. So we're betting that's where memory, I'm betting that's where memory is stored anyway. Um, and then one more thing is about, I mentioned that uh, it looks like consciousness comes too late, but uh, Roger pointed out in his 1989 book that uh, each collapse can send quantum information backward in time. And if that's the case, uh, if you go back to the fact that the activity happens at 300 to 500 milliseconds, uh, in Libet's experiments, he showed backward time referral. So therefore, we can be, uh, Nadal can be hitting, hitting the ball at 100 milliseconds, even though his brain hasn't processed the information. But when it does, it's going to send it backward in time. Uh, I put this idea out in neuroscience, and nobody liked it at all. But if you uh, look at... Uh, Things in neuroscience, there's this backward time effect that's going on all the time, and, people, and they just don't want to deal with it. They just ignore it. I've had this discussion with Christoph Koch, who himself reported some results like this, but then said, nah, forget it. He didn't want to talk about it. So I think this is uh, something that needs, needs to be looked at. So um, just to, to wrap up here, um, I mentioned this, this uh, hierarchical scale from the neurons. Now, most people go this way, larger and larger, and then networks of neurons and then networks of networks. We go down in scale uh, to the uh, small part of the small cell of the brain, and then somehow all the way down to uh, the Planck scale. And it's interesting to look at this in the context of the, the brain's hierarchy as part of the universe's hierarchy. And here's a uh, uh, a diagram of the universe from the very small Planck scale going all the way to the very large, the edge of the known visible universe in scales of 100. And, it, and on a large scale anyway, the microtubules right in the middle. That might be coincidence. But the point I'm trying to make here is that in the, in the oracle art theory, we go from roughly electrons uh, past microtubules, not quite to uh, pyramids in Egypt, but pyramidal cells anyway. And so it's, oops, it's, uh, so it's, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the, part of the universe. Because basically we're saying consciousness is collapse of the wave function, which is a process in fundamental space-time geometry, which is an inherent process of the universe. So we are connected to the universe in this way. So some people take that in a spiritual uh, sense, ontological. Okay, conclusion. Um, Neuroscience needs a new paradigm. I just published a paper called Consciousness and Cognition in the, in the Neuronal Cytoskeleton, a new paradigm needed in neuroscience. So um, six points, three on this slide. Rather than a complex computer of simple neurons, the brain may be more like a quantum orchestra and consciousness more like music than computation. I think the idea that the brain is a complex computer of simple neurons, if you wire them up properly, you get consciousness is wrong. Uh, and it, it, it just need a different explanation. Um, as I said, Orkowar has more supportive evidence, explanatory power, and connection to biology than any other theory of consciousness. Uh, Orkowar can account for memory and offers approach to treatment of mental and cognitive disorders uh, through ultrasound, as I mentioned. Um, anesthesia may act by inhibiting terahertz quantum oscillations in microtubules and psychedelics may act by enhancing them, so increasing the oscillations. Orca War includes the possibility for quantum non-locality, which may be a basis for both quantum, uh, for cognitive binding in the brain, as well as uh, phenomena including parapsychology, near-death and out-of-body experiences, and even, even afterlife. We can't rule out consciousness outside of the brain until we know what's causing it in the brain. If it turns out to be all classical in the brain, well, we're not going to see it non-locally. But if it's a quantum effect in the brain, then these other things are, are possible. And finally, Orca War provides an explanation for the place of consciousness in the universe as a fundamental causal, causal role, quantum state reduction, in fundamental space-time geometry. So it kind of gives us a place in the universe. It gives consciousness a place in the universe. So I'll leave it at that, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, that was a great one. Uh, maybe I took off with my question. Uh, so, uh, from your talk, uh, I'm more or less convinced that one cell is already quite intuitive. It's what? Uh, quite intuitive. One cell. Intelligent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, because of these uh, microtubules and so. 
or I will just so what what additional uh, functionality do you say the connectionist type network would add on to the already really intelligent yeah. microchip around network? Yeah. Um, right. So a single cell, let's say, has ten to the ninth turbulence. Yeah. So by e, uh, time t equals uh, h bar over e sub g, it's going to have uh, I forget the exact number, something like. Uh, maybe a thousand conscious moments per second, which isn't bad. But you and I, and hopefully everybody, uh, and maybe some people have more, have 10 million per second. So it's kind of like a photon. The higher the frequency, the, the more intense, and the more uh, uh, different content. So it's, it's, uh, it, it increases uh, quantitatively and qualitatively because you have more, more per time, yeah, the frequency goes up and the capacity goes up. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, uh, so maybe, so now the talk is open for any questions? And, uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I'm so excited to hear your speech today. Uh, I'm highly interested in origin of self-consciousness. Uh, self-consciousness especially uh, are related to uh, Gerdau's Incompleteness theorem mm -hmm. and Russell paradox, especially metacognition. Uh, so, I have a question for you. Uh, how, okay. uh, who is a conductor to orchestrate <laughs> uh, a micro trouble uh, compound entanglement in micro trouble? Who is a conductor to orchestrate? The conductor? Yes. Like in the orchestra? Yes, okay. there, is, there is no conductor. There, I, I use the orchestra, but then I said there's no conductor. It's more like a, a, a jazz band or a, a jam session yeah, where the musicians see. just play off each other. Because if you had to have the conductor, then you'd, it'd be like a grandfather neuron or grandmother neuron. And some people think, you know, Christoph says the Klaus drum does that, but I don't think you need that. I don't think you want that. I think it's all, it's an orchestra, but an orchestra that, uh, that's more like a, 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 a jam session or a, a jazz band that there's no orchestra. And there's no conductor. No orchestra. No, no conductor. No conductor. It's a conductor. It's it's a it's more it's music, but without a conductor. Who is uh, what is orchestra? Uh, the microchip. Well, uh, okay. So the music would be instead of s vibrations in the air, which is what sound would be uh, vibrations or fluctuations in the structure of the universe. So uh, I think he's asking how can you explain the origin of self consciousness if there's no. Conductor. Oh, self-conscious. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, I would just uh, count uh, binding. Okay, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. there's several several uh, issues there. One is, um, you know, why do we have a one of you inside your head, one of me inside my head? And if you know, uh, you know, Julian Jaynes. Did you ever read his book? Uh, Julian. Julian Jaynes, uh, the uh, origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And he he the main point in that book was that up till, I can't remember exactly, maybe a few hundred thousand years ago, our ancestors, uh, they didn't have a self. They had a bunch of voices in their heads. So, and they called them gods, or they called them, you know, they could be schizophrenic voices. So just a bunch of ununified, uh, there's no self, it was just all a bunch of, a bunch of voices, and somehow they survived. But then they, it kind of got coherent, and it became, uh, it developed a self. I think you can have consciousness without the self, um, but I think we do have a self, and I think it, it's uh, unitary binding. If you say, well, it's because of one particular neuron or one particular part of the brain, then you have the, the grandfather problem all over again. So I, I, think, uh, I, I think we went from a bunch of voices in our heads to one voice in our head by more binding and more coherence and entanglement. And you need entanglement for sure. You need entanglement, like I said, just for, I think probably just for uh, high frequency gamma EEG to, to get that perfectly synchronized. So I think you need, you probably need entanglement for a lot of things that neuroscience just says, you know, doesn't worry about, but that probably should, should worry about. Okay, any Thanks. other question? Uh, okay, go ahead, yeah. Is there anything in micro studios that's material dependent? Could you recreate them and use them to make Make what? For example, they're biological. They're yeah. Could they be recreated in another material? Yeah, uh, right. 
Well, if you had if you had OR or an orc OR in any material, in principle, yes. And probably the best fit for that would be fullerenes. So um, you know, nanotubes, which are basically the, the same benzene rings in a in a sheet. Oh, that'd be graphene. And actually, graphene uh, mediates uh, uh, senses terahertz, and uh, and nanotubes uh, uh, can do the same thing. So uh, if uh, if somebody wanted to build an artificial microtubule or an artificial brain uh, to have work of war, I'd I'd say start with uh, the graphenes and fullerenes. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Yoshi, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, uh, how can you distinguish uh, the microtubule in other cells? And is that new? Uh, I think he's asking, uh, is there anything special about microtubes in neurons as compared to... Uh, 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 plant, okay. plant cells also have a have a blood cells? Uh, plants and uh, any any cells. Yes, all all cells have them, including plant cells. Yeah. yeah. I, I forgot the slide, but but in answer uh, to your question about a single cell, even plants have microtubules. So plants, I actually did this calculation. Plants might have a a, a, a few conscious moments per second, something like that. Uh -huh. Whereas we have ten million. Let's okay. Say. But as far as neurons, the dendrites in the soma, the microtubules, remember, are interrupted in a mixed polarity. And I didn't really talk about this, but they have a polarity. They have a plus end and a minus end. So in all cells, other than neurons, the microtubules are like, are radial. At, uh, they start at the, at the excuse me, center zone and go outward, like spokes of a wheel from a hub. And they're all pointing in the same direction. Uh, beta plus, alpha minus. So they're all they're all in the same alignment, and they're all uh, in, uh, continuous and non-interrupted. In dendrites and and, uh, and cell bodies, they're broken. They're interrupted and uh, in mixed polarity. So this one's pointing up. This one's pointing down. And there's never been a good explanation for that. Roger and I think that that what that does is if you've got a mixed polarity. And they're both in, in a membrane, uh, enveloped by a membrane, neur neuronal membrane, so they're going to be a, in a common voltage. That means they're going to be in slightly different energies in relation to the external voltage. That means they're going to oscillate at slightly different frequencies. That means they're going to give you beats, interference beats. And I think it's the interference beats that gives you consciousness all the way you know, up to the whole brain level. And you may not need that in a really small organism, but when you get up you know, a big organ like a brain, you need uh, interference beats to get you from, you know, the terahertz to the gigahertz, the megahertz, the kilohertz to the hertz. So that's the main difference in, in neuronal uh, microtubules is that uh, in dendrites and soma, not in axons, but in dendrites and soma, they're interrupted in a mixed polarity. So that's unique in all of biology. It's not found in any other cell. Okay. Uh any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your inspirational talk. Um, well, uh, I really agree that the Hodgkin hack brain model uh, is too simple to describe our consciousness, but uh, I wonder how you explain uh, uh, the consciousness of the Alzheimer's, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, because uh, even in uh, people with uh, people with severe Alzheimer's disease uh, can have a moment of lucidity, yeah. lucid moment, lucid yeah. awareness, but their microstructure, microtubule structure are severely dis uh, Right. Well, I'd say there's a, there's a difference between memory and cognition on the one hand and then consciousness. Because I think, you know, uh, Alzheimer's patients, even if they're demented, even if you know, they don't know where they are, they're disoriented, they have no memory. They're still awake, they're still conscious. So I think that's different. And, and what they're missing are the synapses, okay? So that, that's going to, uh, I think, because when you lose microtubules, you're going to lose synapses too, and, and the tau protein. So I think they're still conscious, although they're going to lose some of that. 
uh, but they lose mostly cognition and memory. Even though the uh, I said before, memory is encoded in the microtubules, it still needs a synapses to distribute it. Thank you. Is Dr. Oizumi in the room? No. Oh, uh, you know this this guy um, doing IIT. If, if oh yeah. Can, but he said he will be coming, but obviously he, for some reasons or other, he couldn't make it. So anyway, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Oh, I I know you want to ask uh, many questions, but uh, you want. No, oh yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, David Chavez argued uh, orchestrated objective reduction theory can't deal with uh, phenomenal aspects of consciousness. What do you think about that? He's wrong. Oh, okay. He's wrong. Uh, uh, Dave's a good friend of mine, but we've been we've been butting butting heads for a long time. Uh, we say that the hard problem we um, approach the hard problem by saying that collapse, objective reduction, yeah. gives qualia. Yeah. Uh, every time there's a objective reduction which occurs spontaneously, you get a moment of, of some experience. If it's random, it's going to be random, disconnected, yeah. and we're not going to know about it. But if it's in our brains and it's unified and coherent and entangled and integrated and orchestrated, uh, then, uh, then you get the kind of consciousness we have. Now Dave, uh, Dave's been on, you know, he started out as a uh, functionalist, then he was an AI guy, then he was a dualist, and then he was a, uh, what do you call it, a simulationist, and then he was something else, and now he's, he's into quantum as the conscious observer causing collapse. So he's the same, which is dualist, and he admits that, it's yeah. dualism. So I think he doesn't want a solution. In fact, uh, for example, when we decided in 2014 to change the name of the conference from toward the science of consciousness to the science of consciousness, he said, no, 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 you can't do that. Well, why not? I said, you don't have the answer yet. I said, well, but we have experiments now that are moving towards it. So I think he's, he's, he's trying to keep it the status quo. Uh, he wants to keep it as a mystery. Now, I'm not saying we have it solved, but I think we're, we're making some progress. He's a good friend of mine, but we disagree. Thanks. Uh, so, Stuart, actually, uh, you arrived yesterday, right? Yeah. So you might be still jet lagged or anything. But I'm so know. hungry. Yeah. Or what? Right. <laughs> so I, I hope I do hope that this will be a, the beginning of a beautiful friendship between yeah. you and this group. But my final question. This is a kind of a something that you know I, I really wanted to ask. You're yeah. see no, 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 no. Uh, do you and Roger ever? Do you, do you and Roger ever talk about receiving the Nobel Prize together? You, your first one and Roger's second one? I'm just curious. No. No? <laughs> no. But, but uh, Roger, you know, he was kind of embarrassed by his Nobel Prize. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, after that happened, he got so many invitations for oh. interviews and for articles uh -huh. and for business. He said, you know, I'm thinking of sending it back. Oh, really? <laughs> I think he was kidding, but you know, he, he's very happy now, just he's writing two different books. And oh, really? Wow. He's very active in the, uh, the experiments from uh, uh, the microtubule experiments. Uh -huh. And uh, he, you know, he did, he's, he's not keen on traveling. He lives, you know, we visited him uh, about a year ago. And uh, he lives in a flat in Oxford and walks every day. He's doing very well. Great. Uh, so. He wouldn't talk about that. Although we, he and I were nominated for the Cobley Prize. You know the, oh. Co the Cobley Foundation. Sure, sure. Yeah, we didn't get it, but I, th I was very honored to be to be nominated. Uh, you never know. Uh, you might get your first one, and Roger the second one. Oh, thank you. Fingers crossed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but so uh, let's thank uh, Stuart. Oh, 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 do you want a question? <laughs> no. Okay. Bye. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, how can we decode the? Consciousness or quality uh, decoding. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, which level uh, uh, micro tubing or neuron or uh, pi resonance or uh, which level is better to explain consciousness for, think, for yeah. de decoding? Uh, well, you you kind of need all of those. We're we're you know we're not claiming we can totally explain the harm problem, but I think. Where you have to look is in the collapse, is in the quantum state reduction. 
And so uh, if you have, uh, you know, if each or orca OR event is 10 to the 15th tubulins, and each of those tubulins can be in a number of different states, just say two states, that's a lot of different qualia that you can have uh, that's determined. Now, that would have to also be reflected in the space-time geometry, which we don't know about yet. I mean, Roger's the world's expert in that, and he doesn't know what it looks like. He, you know, twister theory, spin networks, he's, um, quantum gra loop gravity, all that kind of stuff. But there's some kind of structure down there that, that is in a particular configuration, and whatever that configuration collapses to, that's the, that's the quality that you get. So we're basically saying it's fundamental, kind of like the panpsychists, but the panpsychists say that it's a property of, of matter, whereas we say, no, it's, the, it's the, the collapse that gives you the matter, that gives you the matter in that particular uh, configuration. So I think we have to know more about the, the collapse. And uh, there was just a, a recent paper criticizing us uh, about uh, Penrose objective reduction versus Diossi objective reduction. And uh, they claim they disproved this, but they did. They got it all backwards. And I'm writing a re response to that. But, but if I understand, uh, you can look at, I, you need all those levels. But the, the final thing that gives it to you is the collapse event. And that's happening all around us, mm. even as we speak but usually random and disconnected. Only in our brains is it unified and orchestrated. So remember the, the metaphor of the musicians tuning their, or, their, their, their instruments. You know, you hear, if you go to the symphony and you're, and, and, uh, you know, the, it's noise, it's a cacophony. So the difference between that, that's kind of what's going on with the, the consciousness around us in the, in the material world, or in the non-biological you know, non world. Um, but then our brains are like the, the orchestra that puts it all together into music. So you know the difference between music and noise, and everybody does, but it's kind of hard to explain. Nonetheless, it's different, and I think that's a good, a good analogy, anyway. I think you have, your talk has been music to our ears, and <laughs> thank you for this really wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. ということで皆さんお疲れ様でした。